Hey guys, and welcome to Field Notes. We're gonna be talking about a really basic concept today that kind of plays back into our earthquake series. As we've mentioned in that series, one of the major causes for earthquakes is rocks faulting. Now, there are several different ways that a rock will fault, and those are what we're going to be talking about today. But in general, a fault is simply a break. And because rocks are difficult, they won't always break in just one single faulting line. So instead of really referring to a singular fault, geologists will often refer to a fault zone, which is basically just an area in which many different faults are probably happening. So first, let's go over kind of the anatomy of a fault. If you think about a fault, you obviously have one side and you have the other side, between which there is the actual fault or the actual break. One of these sides will be called the hanging wall, and one of these sides will be called the foot wall. Now you might be thinking, how do you tell which one is the hanging and which one is the foot wall? Well, it is much simpler than you think. If we have a picture of a faulted area, if you draw a little man and think, what place would he hang his lantern and which one would he be standing on? then you will know which one is the hanging wall because it will be the one that he has hung his lantern on and the foot wall is one he is standing on. There's actually terms that are borrowed from mining, uh, which makes sense because we are considering like a little miner. Along with having these two different sides, there will also be something called a fault scarp, which is simply where you can see the displacement of the fault. So we've got the fault zone, the hanging wall, the foot wall, and the fault scarp. And that is really all you need to know in terms of anatomy of a fault zone to at least start out with. So like I said, there are a few different types of faults and let's first start with the most normal, the normal fault. <laughs> we look at a diagram of a normal fault. The side that looks like it should normally be pulled down by gravity is the one that is actually moving down. And this is what makes it a normal fault is that this is the block that should normally be falling down or behaving normally or consistently with how we think gravity should be affecting the blocks. A reverse fault is just like the name suggests, it is moving reverse what we think gravity should be making it do. Or the hanging wall is actually moving up. That is really all that determines whether it is a normal or reverse fault is the direction of these two blocks. It is however important to know. It is important to know which kind of fault you are dealing with because then you can determine all sorts of other things. If the if you know what kind of fault you are dealing with, you will understand the tectonics or the faulting and pressure of the area a lot easier. So good thing to keep in mind. The next type of fault is also one that we see when we talk about plate tectonics, and that is a strike slip fault. And these will happen in other places as well as on plate boundaries. It is not only found on plate boundaries. You will find these intercontinental as well. A strike slip fault can be either right lateral or left lateral, depending on its movement and which blocks are moving in which directions. There's nothing really that distinguishes those two types of faulting. It's just a different direction that the strike slip is moving. A strike slip fault is one where two pieces of rock are kind of rubbing together. Neither one is falling, they're sliding along each other. And really sliding and slip, strike slip faulting is a misnomer because they don't really slip. There's not a lot of slipping going on. It's much more of a stutter. It's more of a pressure builds up, pressure builds up, pressure builds up, slip, and then it builds up and it builds up and it builds up and then it slips again. So it's it's waiting until there's enough energy, stuttering, waiting until there's enough energy, stuttering, that sort of thing, rather than a continuous like grind across each other. The last kind of fault that I wanted to bring up today is actually a kind of reverse fault. And this is called a thrust fault. I wanted to bring these up because I think it's really cool to be able to look at pictures of mountains or outcrops and be able to tell exactly what is going on. And thrust faulting is one of those ones that you could really see um, kind of immediately when you see like a landscape. So a thrust fault, like I said, is just a type of reverse fault. This, however, means that the faulted plane, so the actual like line of breakage, is less than 45 degrees. So it is a very shallow fault plane, and that is what makes it kind of do the thrusting motion. I'll have some pictures of really good examples of thrust faults here. So those are four different types of faults. Remember that the movement of these rocks and the actual faulting process is going to cause earthquake. Whether it is a small movement or a big movement will probably also determine uh, how big of an earthquake or how big of a seismic event that you will you will get. Another thing that will influence is how deep this fault is. If it is a very deep fault, then you are not going to be able to feel it 
quite as much as if it was a fault that was right on the surface. So it is a good thing to keep in mind when we talk about earthquakes and we talk about mountain building, which we will in the future. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you missed my last video, I am now on Patreon, so if you like these videos, be sure to check down below and check out my Patreon page, check out some of the perks you could get from supporting the show, or just give me a like. Hit subscribe if you want to keep up to date with everything that goes on on this channel, and I will see you guys next time. Hey guys, and welcome to Field Notes. Today I have a somewhat different video for you guys, and that is to announce that I am now on Patreon. As you guys know, I'm coming up on my third year on YouTube, and this is something that I have really loved doing. And because of that, I would love to be able to make this a sustainable thing. 